So, hello everybody. Welcome to today's nuclear physics race session. Before we introduce the speaker, a few quick reminders. If you have questions, you, you have two options. You can write them in the Q&A section of the Zoom app you're in, or if you prefer to ask them yourself, raise your hand and we'll get to you at the end of the talk. The second reminder is for those of you that wanted to attend the virtual JLab tour, there's been a bit of a delay and will presumably proceed next week. Please stay tuned for more information, you will be notified. So don't worry about that. Now, let's go to Nobuo. Nobuo Sato is a Jefferson Lab staff scientist. His research interests lie in the structure of nucleons, that is the protons and neutrons that make up this world. And his research is focused on determining parton distribution functions and fragmentation functions from both current data at JLab, as well as future data coming from the electron ion collider. Nobuo has led pioneering global analyses of parton distribution functions, which tell us how quarks and gluons make up the nucleons, that is the protons and the neutrons. What Nabua will talk today is about nuclear femtography. This is a very recent program started up here in the US that aims to make a 3D picture of the proton and the neutron. Please go ahead, Nabua. Thank you, Luca, for the nice introduction. Um, so, <clears throat> Yeah, I will be talking about this um, exciting field of nuclear photography, and I'm probably not be able to cover all the details everywhere. But I just want to give you a sense of what is being, you know, uh, why we're doing this, how is it being done, and 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 why we know that we are doing the correct thing. Um, so uh, the organizers asked me to to briefly mention who I am from my own history um, um, because that might be an interest for some of the audience. Um, so I'm actually from South America, despite the fact that my name is Asian, but I'm from Cali, Colombia. Um, and I did my bachelor's degree in at the Universidad del Valle, which is a university in Cali, uh, where basically my career as a physicist started. Back then, I was always interested in, in um, theoretical physics. I was more interested in general relativity as well as cosmology. I even uh, did a thesis on, on dark energy uh, uh, physics involving tachyons and so on and so forth. Um, after that, I pursued my PhD um, at Florida State University, again, following my, uh, my uh, research interest in, in uh, basically in particle physics. I got more interested in particle physics after my bachelor's degree. And there I started working on perturbative QCD, structures of hadrons and collider phenomenology. Um, and after did, and I did a, a thesis on something called direct photon production, which is something associated with high energy collisions. And after that, I moved to Jefferson Lab, where my research horizon expanded, uh, which involved things like QCD factorization, and stuff that Luke just mentioned about hydrogen structure, hydronization, and so on and so forth. And um, this is just to summarize to say that, you know, in principle, uh, I am a demonstration that if you follow a physics path, you can get a job. And I managed to walk through this uh, um, lifestyle of doing as a physicist doing postdocs after my PhD. I did three postdocs up until I was permanently hired at Jefferson Lab, actually very recent since yet, uh, last year. Okay, so uh, let me just dive in now on the main theme of, 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 of my research, which is ar around the question of 
what is the wall that we can see made of? Now, this question depends on who do you ask. If you ask a cosmologist, uh, astrophysicist, they will tell you the universe is made of such and such, like dark energy or dark matter and so on and so forth. I'm more interested in more mundane things like we can see, okay? And like an apple, right? And so this question about what an apple is made of has been uh, driven since the beginnings of where humans start thinking about this more than 2000 years ago, starting from this guy uh, called Democritus. And he thought, well, everything has to be made of atoms. So of course, these days we know a lot of things about what is the thing that we see made of. And it's a story about also the scales. So an apple is roughly, you know, 10 centimeters, so it's a 10 of a meter. So you have to divide the apple uh, a meter in 10 pieces, and that's your uh, the size of an apple. But you can actually go and dive in even more deeper by repeating this exercise of dividing in 10 parts nine times, at which point you will hit an object like molecules, like a fructose, and that's on the scale of 10 to the minus nine. And we know also that if you look at inside of molecules, you have atoms such as the carbon atom, and that is around 10 to the minus 12 meters. And this is basically the picture that everyone who finished high school probably know, right? Uh, that there are atoms, that inside of atoms, we have a core nuclei with protons and neutrons, and there are electrons around that. It turns out that this thing is not the actual object of the, you know, of how an apple is made of, because we also know that there is a substructure inside of each of these protons and neutrons. So, and this substructure is made of things that we call quarks and gluons. And this is an entire new world where we don't see it, but it exists. And the scale at which they exist is 10 to the minus 15. We never see quarks and gluons basically in isolation. What we see is basically a bound state of this system of particles that we collectively call protons, or we call them in gener generically as hadrons. So protons and neutrons being an example of that. And in the title of my talk, I have the femtoscale or uh, femtography is basically a science that surrounds around 10 to the minus 15, okay? So, um, so as just as a, re, uh, 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 just an, uh, to give an overview, most of you know about this, these are the ultimate particles that we know as of today. Of course, there are other things that we don't know, such as dark matter and dark energy, but everything that we know of today are summarized in this chart of particles. The upper part are called the quarks. Uh, those are the stuff that made up basically protons and neutrons. The upper one are this, the lower ones are called leptons. And the ones that probably you are more familiar with is the electron, right? Because the electrons are passing through your wires. And um, you also have this intermediate particles here called gauge bosons that allows these particles to talk to each other. So the question about what is the universe made of or what is what the matter made of, uh, it's not just interesting to know what is that thing made of, but it's also interesting to know how they talk to each other, how they interact. Um, so that's the next, next question I want to address, how these particles really interact with each other. And when I started to learn about this, I was always very confused up until someone explained me to simple cartoon that I know uh, from basic physics. So imagine that you and your friend, you're sitting in a lake on two boats and you are not moving relative to your friend. And then let's say, let's say that you have a ball which is in red and you throw that ball to your friend. So we know from basic Newtonian physics that 
uh, in order to conserve the total momentum, because at the beginning you didn't have the total momentum of the system was zero, that has to conserve. Then if you actually tr put in motion one part of the object, basically throwing a ball, necessarily you have to recoil that to conserve the momentum. And so you will start moving backwards. And then once you throw that ball to the other person, the other person will receive an extra momentum and that will make him that person to move backwards too. So you can see that two people, you and your friend, can exchange a ball to inter, you know, to to interact between you guys, right? So this is what a, you know, uh, uh, an easy way to understand that two things can interact by exchanging something. So of course, this mechanism is completely understood and easy to digest in ordinary Newtonian mechanics uh, that you can learn in high school or even in. Um, uh, when you're doing this on degree in physics. Um, but, you know, the question is how the elementary particles then interact each other. And that is beyond the Newtonian's law. And that is more complicated. Um, so here is how they look like that. This is basically the theory. All this stuff that is written here is a complicated theory that describes how these particles interact each other. And this is known as the standard model. Um, I'm going to be emphasizing more on the structure of the protons and nucleons, which are basically uh, uh, made up in terms of quarks. So I'm more interested in looking at the piece of these interactions that are uh, connecting basically the quarks and gluons inside of these, you know, objects that we call hadrons. And it turns out that the basic part that controls that is the first line of this uh, marvelous equation, no, uh, and, and that is known as quantum thermodynamics, or simply called QCD. So QCD, also known as the theory of strong interactions, is the theory that basically controls how the quarks and gluons talk to each other. And the miracle here is that they are bounded and they are confined in a system and they can never escape, okay? All right, so the next question that I want to address is, okay, you know, uh, that seems to be like a lot of that we know, but how do we know really these things, right? That would, that would be at least for me, the natural question. How do I know that this is not a, a, a fairly story, you know, some, something that I made up? And the answer is basically in the so-called scattering experiments. And I'm going to try to walk you through uh, how do we know all these things in terms of scattering experiments. So here is an example of a scattering experiment uh, that it was done around the years 2000s uh, in Hamburg, Germany. And this was called the Hera Collider. So in one direction, they were collide, they were, they were uh, circulating electrons at high, you know, ver very high speed, almost close to the speed of light. And in the opposite direction, protons were circulated and they let them collide in two intersection points called the H1 detector and Zeus detector. Okay. So, um, so here is sort of the, you know, a picture of what's going on from the left side you know, an electron comes in and from the other side, the proton comes in. And then a reaction happens. And then as a result, there is an outgoing electron that comes out of it. And this outgoing electron can be detected. So the, the detector on its own is mostly like a camera where it can detect what is the energy of that electron that comes out of it and what is the polar angle and what is the azimuthal angles. This picture here is a transverse picture of the detector, while this one here is uh, looking at from the uh, from the up uh, from the beam direction. So this thing that I'm showing here is basically an event, okay, that is being seen by the detector. An event is basically when you collide two things and you observe the outcome, and the proton actually get disintegrated, and it's actually uh, 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 transform into new objects thanks to quantum mechanics, 
into other objects that are again other hadronic debris so like pions and canyons there are other particles that are made of also quarks and gluons and they are detected uh, in the system so the main question here is what exactly is going on that is the actual question when we are dealing with particle physics is what's going on at this interaction region and i i told you that the quarks and gluons are confined in a 10 to the minus 15 scales so what we want to understand at the end of the day is what happened at 10 to the minus 15 by looking at stuff that comes at the detector size which are order of meters right so roughly speaking the our current understanding of what's going on follows us you know in the following picture so an electron coming in and it will dive inside of a proton and it will exchange in the same way that we we talked earlier about exchanging balls you will exchange a photon uh, and then it will basically talk to the quarks that is inside of the proton and a quark will get knocked off and so this outgoing quark for instance will eventually transform into hadrons that will be detected here and this outgoing electron is what i show basically here and this is basically the mechanism you know at which these particles interact but i want to you know you might say okay easy peasy you know this is an easy you know easy understanding of what's going on but i want you to appreciate a little bit about what it means really that this is occurring at 10 to the minus 15 meters so in order to do that, let's ask the question, how small is really 10 to the minus 15? And in order to get some sense out of that, let's suppose that we scale up the, uh, the size of 10 to the minus 15 to the size of an earth. So, so we know that a detector is more or less like 10 meters and the size of interaction is 10 to the minus 15. So we are observing things order 10 meters and trying to see you know the dynamics around 10 to the minus 15 so what if we scale up this number to the size of it and what will be the size of the detector right just to have a feeling about what are the scales that we're talking about and so here is the size of the earth uh in in the cosmos so roughly 10 to the 7 meters and if you do the math you will find that the scale at which you have a detector will be mostly around 10 to the 23 meters. That's a, you know, maybe an, an irrelevant number for us to really imagine. Uh, but maybe, you know, let me show you some, some more hints to see more or less how big this problem is. So 10 to the 23 meters is roughly 10 to the seven light years. Okay, still not helping too much, but roughly speaking, this picture might help better. The estimated size of Milky Way, which is the galaxy where Earth lives, somewhere in the galaxy, I have no idea where exactly it is. And of course, the Earth is not as big as, the, as my cartoon shows, but the galaxy is more or less like 10 to the 4 light years. And if we are saying that the, 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 the point where, where, where we are detecting things is 10 to the 7 light years, you can immediately see that the detector size is actually far away from the galaxy, right? So, so if we scale up the, ten to the femtometer scales to the scale of the Earth, the detector is actually much bigger than the galaxy itself. So at this point, you, you should ask, well, this seems to be crazy, um, but I can't guarantee you that this works. And it works be because we have tested this thing many, many times. And I want you to sort of give you a hint of why do we know and how do we uh, are convinced that these things really works. So the first thing we, we, we really need to do is to go back to those events and try to convert into histograms. Now, I know that for some of you, histograms are not something that you use in every day, but let me show you a, an example of a histogram that you, you probably might be familiar these days. So for instance, here is the coronavirus uh, map in the US. And uh, you can see that there are different blocks, different blocks, basically the map has been divided in multiple pieces. And each of these pieces are basically different counties, right? Different areas. And what they are doing is basically they are counting how many people have been sick in that particular county. So 
an event that I mentioned before, like an event of scattering something, is basically counting something. So uh, once you start counting many, many, you know, uh, collect all the data across across the whole whole country, you can start basically doing the histogram, right? And then with this histogramming procedure, you can get a profile and a sense of where you know things are going bad. So of course, if you want to know where to where are the places that you want to avoid? Well, you will avoid the places where the histogram has higher probabilities. And so basically this picture that you see here is basically kind of a probability density for where things are you know, bad at the moment. Um, and another impo important thing is that knowing histograms, it gives you a sense of statistics and it gives you an opportunity to really model what's going on so 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 now let's go back to the events that i was talking about so and if so in this case we want to do a histogram and our map is basically the detector so what we want to do is to basically uh, count how many particles have hit on a specific corner you know a county quote unquote but the county space is basically delineated by a beam in energy because you can measure how energetic the particle was. And so these three numbers are basically the coordinates uh, that we want to do the histogram. And of course, you have to repeat this process many, many, many times. Often you will see the Jefferson lab experiments are called high luminosity and high luminosity in essence means you collide him many, many, many times. And it is in this way that you repeat many, many times that allows you to beat the problem of the scales, that you can really know what's, what's going on inside of the femtometer scales because you, are, you have actually poked the problem a gazillion of times, okay? So now let's suppose that you recall the events, event one, event two, and then there will be a billion of events and it will be rows where you, you basically collect the values that you get, right? And now we want to sort of do the histogram. So um, for, for some of you, this might be a, a really weird histogram, but it's still a histogram in two dimensions, basically the polar angle that goes from zero to 180 degrees. And this is the momentum or basically the energy of the particle. And each of the blocks is the analog of the county and the heats of the coronavirus uh, um, counts. So what is being color coded here is how many events are actually sitting in each of these uh, coordinates of the angle and energy. So this is the meaning of a histogram. And you can see that it's more probable uh, to observe particles that are in this corner than in this other area of of the of the face space or you know your your uh, yeah your your space basically. So histograms again is basically a representation of probability densities, and all we're doing is counting how many particles are inside of each of these bins. So this is the bin. This is the number of counts inside of that bin. And this is the total number of events. And that is a proxy for a probability density, okay? This is the quantity that actually uh, uh, is important in basically in particle physics. Everything in particle physics at the end of the day on Mars is this probability density. So why is that this probability density is important? Well, as I said before, you know, having a probability density allows you to sort of connect with some models, right? Like in the COVID case. Here, we actually can connect with the underlying theory. And that theory is precisely the QCD theory, all those crazy equations that I showed at the beginning. We can, in principle, connect, connect this object um, to, to the, uh, the theory that I described. And this is how do we, kn we know that you know, we have a correct interpretation of nature. So back to that cartoon that I showed that we have this incoming electron that exchange uh, a photon with the quark that is inside of the proton. Roughly speaking, this part of the interaction, which is in the theory, is something that we can actually calculate by hand using something called perturbation theory. That involves things like Feynman diagrams for, for, 
some of you have heard of this thing. So basically, this is kind of a cartoonish way of drawing the Feynman diagram. But in order to really, you know, describe the whole reaction, we also need addition, an additional ingredient. And one of the ingredients we need to know is basically the momentum of each of these quarks. And all we have under control at the detector level is basically the momentum of the incoming proton beam. But we don't have a, really a control over what is the momentum of the quark. And we, if we don't know that, we cannot do, really do any calculation of that nature or describe the process as a whole. So recall, you know, the proton is made of quarks and gluons, right? And then you can imagine that each of these quarks and gluons will carry certain momentum fraction of the whole of the totality. You cannot take a, 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 a negative momentum fraction because otherwise it's unphysical. You know, it's a quark that is moving in the opposite direction, then it's not part of the system. It cannot also exceed the full, the total momentum of the proton because if it does, then it also doesn't make any sense. So this fraction, of course, is between zero and one. And you can imagine that, you know, we can sort of uh, define a, an object that describes the probability density for finding a given quark or gluon with certain momentum fraction because this is um, probabilistic in nature, essentially. And so these quantities are called parton distribution functions, which are one of the objects of interest. But the reason that is interest is the following. Suppose you know this function as it is, right? Suppose I tell you I know how quarks and gluons are distributed within the proton. Well, that on its own, it means that you are really knowing the internal guts of the proton itself. Basically, you, this information is telling you a picture of what's go, how the proton look inside in terms of quarks and gluons. And you might say, well, I, I, this is not what I've expected. Maybe I want to see some kind of a buildings and structures or crystalline structure, but that's not how reality works. These particles are actually moving and all we can characterize in, you know, in terms of the theory is how they are distributed within the system. Okay, in this context, we will be the proton. So this is essentially how the theory, which is, you know, what I, you know, all those Feynman diagrams, as well as, you know, uh, uh, this concept of quarks and gluons can be connected with what we actually measure in terms of the scattering, in terms of the scattering experiments. So recall what we want, you know, in, ex in scattering experiments, what we want is basically the histograms or equivalently the probability densities, right? And this quantity can be related uh, to the theoretical formalism um, in terms of a convolution of two pieces. So I know that this is a lot, but roughly speaking, this f of i is this probability density to find a given quark or, or gluon inside of the proton. And the h factor that I was mentioned in here is actually calculable. And this is basically, you know, calculable in terms of something that looks like this. Okay. So, so what, you know, the goal, you know, the, you know, this, this slide here basically tells you how do you connect the world of quarks and gluons, which is encoded here in this factorization theorem or, you know, this formally into something that you reconstruct just by doing a counting experiment, just by histogram, you know, your detector essentially. And with that, well, that's basically photography. On a photography on the most simplest case ever, which is the one dimensional distribution, because here I'm, I'm considering only the distributions of quarks and gluons in the longitudinal motion. That's the only thing that I'm looking at. But in reality, the proton lives in three dimension. So basically you can also have the transverse momentum distribution, which is beyond the scope of my talk here, but you can sort of see that you can generalize this concept and try to sort of do the full tomography of the proton, which is still a crazy idea because the scales at which we observe are wildly different from the scales at which these quarks and gluons talk each other that made up the proton. So just to give you a sense of more or less how these objects, um, roughly speaking, look like, these are some examples that I'm showing here 
uh, of the part on you know of the part on densities, basically uh, this object here, these functions. Um, and so you can see here uh, different flavors because you know each flavor can come differently you know uh, inside of the proton. Why is that? Well, because the proton is mostly made of in terms of two up quarks and one down quark. That's, those are the quantum numbers, the chemistry that builds the proton as a whole. But in reality, there are gluons that are connecting these valent, the so-called valence quarks, and these gluons can actually split arbitrarily into QQ bars or up and anti that up and anti up or down and anti up anti down quarks all the time. So basically, we can always see, you know, in, in reality, there are an infinity amount of quarks actually, you know, made, making up this proton. And all we can have access is basically the probability distributions for how they are distributed. And in this case, uh, is basically the longitudinal one. So it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a really exciting picture or photographic picture of how quarks, uh, how the proton look like inside. But I think that if you try to stack all the story that I just told you, that you know you have to make events, a detector that are order of 10 meter scales, looking at things that 10 to the minus 15, and this is what you can actually see in nature. This is a remarkable uh, thing that you know human can has been able to do so far to under, to ha to have some hints of what's going on inside of protons. So with that, let me just uh, um, summarize uh, my talk here, which was pretty brief. Um, so, so you know, the the way that you know the first thing, the takeaway message that you should take is is that uh, quarks and gluons are really not visible in nature. You cannot really see them unless you do scattering experiments, and you you can sort of connect the ex scattering experiments. With the theoretical formalisms, um, I just show only one particular aspect of photography, which is the one-dimensional distribution of of quarks and gluons. But as I said, there are many more objects that you can study in the full 3D picture, such as TMDs or generalized parton densities, and so on and so forth. And the other thing that uh, I should mention is that this is just one aspect of photography. Uh, which is how things are made up inside of the proton. But in reality, I, I should, we, should, we can also ask the question of how the hadrons on its own are formed after a while, after a while collision. So for instance, if I go back to uh, this picture here, right? So initially we have, we have a proton coming in and then it gets completely dis you know, disintegrated in the, in the hard reaction. And then the cause coming out but then eventually they will hadronize in something that it will be again bound systems of quarks and gluons. So this is the so-called process of hadronization. And by the way, that all that stuff happens in 10 to the minus 15 because that's you know you know as soon as they escape that region of of, phase state, uh, of the space time, they will become again bound states. So this there is another complementary science known as hadron formation. And this is a particular, you know, cartoon picture that I'm showing here. In this case, I'm colliding a proton and a proton uh, head to head. And this is an illustration of, in principle, how quarks can recombine and form the observed hadron. So this is sort of the picture that typically is shown at large hadron collider, for instance. And um, and this is an exciting time to really be involved in this kind of field because. Really, you know, we have understood the fundamental ingredients of nature, basically all those particles in the standard model. But the next question that we want to address, the next frontier in particle physics is how we actually go from these quarks and the theory that we know in terms of the bound systems that we observe, such as hydrogens, as well as the hydrogen station. And with that, I will take any questions, if any. Thank you. Thank you, Nabo. That was a very interesting talk. We have one question from the audience right now, and it is, how big are the quarks and how different are the observed sides of quarks and gluon versus their actual size? Um, that's a very good question. I have been all, always thinking about that. 
Um, these are point-like point -like particles, which means as of today, we, know, we don't know if they have a substructure. So with the current experimental uh, setups, we know that there is no underlying structure. And if there is no underlying structure, it means they are point-like. Of course, there are other theories, such as string theory and so on and so forth, that you know that it will say that well maybe you know these elementary particles even have structure like strings right but as of today the only you know there are no evidence whatsoever that these particles has a structure we know that the proton do have a substructure and the elementary constituents are the quarks and and, and gluons so these particles is essentially the atoms that democritus you know ought to you know imagine more than 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Thank you. I don't see any other questions, but if you don't mind, I have a few. So you mentioned probability distributions that you can... Actually, let's go to the student's question. I think it's much more interesting than mine. What is the current understanding around halogenation on the sun? Is there a possibility of some new elementary particle interacting there that we may not have considered? Can you repeat the question again? I heard sun, but I don't know if I heard okay. correctly. Sorry. What is the current understanding around halogenation on the sun? Is there a possibility of some new elementary particle interacting there that we may not have considered? Specifically in the sun, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that I don't know. So um, all we know in terms of elementary particles these days are things that are within our controllable experiments. There has been decades of particle experiments since Rutherford experiment that, you know, that shows that, you know, the, um, the atoms were, you know, had a nuclei and, and so on and so forth, right? And, and everything that we know, all this stuff that I showed today is based on particle experiments on Earth. Now, of course, there are other experiments such as, you know, neutrinos, right, experiments which look like, uh, which look um, with, you know, showers of neutrinos coming from bursts in the, in the galaxy, you know. But again, still is things associated with things that we can actually do on Earth. And I don't think that there has been a more substantial things to learn about particle physics besides the, exper the scattering experiment that I mentioned. Thank you. So now my question again, uh, how do you relate these probability distributions that you showed us so nicely to actual theories, right? You calculate something in QCD, you get some process. How do you relate it to this probability distribution and then to the experimental data seen in the detector? So this is the actual connection. Left hand side is the wall of humans doing histograms. That's basically a scattering experiment is nothing but doing a histogram. And of course, you can define your histogram as you wish, you know, depending on what you look at. So in this case, I've just shown an example of electron proton scattering just by looking at the electron degrees of freedom in terms of these three variables. And we can utilize the so-called factorization theorem that allows us to relate this, this probability density, this histogram, in terms of something that we can calculate uh, by hand uh, and something that we cannot. That's something that we can calculate by hand uh, follows Feynman rules from our uh, theory. And you, know, you just square the amplitude and you can calculate this part. But in order to complete, relate, you know, in order to compute the probability density that you can measure, you need to know basically how this, you know, incoming quark, what is the momentum of this incoming quark, right? But of course, you cannot set it up, you, you cannot determine what is the momentum of the incoming quark or, or, or gluon, because you cannot have access to that technology. You, the only thing that you can control is the incoming proton. So what it means at the end is that you have to sum over all possibilities that occurs in this scattering. And this summation of all possibilities is this sum here, and all possibilities is encoded in terms of this probability density. 
So, you know, in some regions are, you know, some momentum fractions for certain quarks are more preferable. And that description is, you know, can be described here. This is basically showing that these Fs, you know, the momentum fraction of the, of the quarks and gluon are not, you know, basically, you know, equal everywhere, you know, it depends. And then of course, if, you know, for the up quark and down quark, they tend to peak in the high X region because that is, that is, you know, in the high X region, the proton looks more like a valence structure. So they will, you know, you know there will be more quark, up quarks and down quarks in that region. But if you go to very small X region where, you know, um, where the, pro the proton looks more like a gluons, right, Be effectively, and then you will see more basic gluons. So that's why you see that the gluons are rising towards small X. Follow-up question. You had a diagram of all the particles in the standard model, and there you had six quarks listed. Are there any other quarks in the nucleon or just up and down? Um, so there's an interesting question. I will make a slight twist on that. And so um, the top quark actually, uh, in principle, the top quark could be in the proton, in principle, but it's extremely, extremely improbable. It will probably never exist in the proton because one of the interesting things is that the top quark will decay before it can get you know, into a bound state. So that's why there are no known uh, bound states of the, of the top quark because it escapes the, you know, the, 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 the world of, 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 of getting confined by the gluons. So the, the, the proton is mostly made of up quarks and down quarks in terms of the um, quantum numbers of the proton, but in reality it is surrounded, you know, it, you know, is a mix of gluons and the gluons can split into any of these particles and with an extremely, extremely rare occasion with an extremely, extremely small amount, it can fluctuate into a TT buffer, but that's really, really rare, which is basically for practical purposes, you never see, you are never made of top quarks in your body ever. But for sure, I know that you are made of up quarks and down quarks. Thank you. Does the audience have any more questions? Perhaps an, a question about Unibor. How did you come? Oh, we do have a question from Elizabeth Goodman. Is there any chance you could talk more about that giant equation in the slide for the standard model? What does it describe? How does one use it? How did we begin to figure out the math that is so complicated that? That's a good question. So, um, as I told you here, the the mechanics. So, you know, you should always try to root this concept of how you can interact with your friend with a ball. And you know very well from Newtonian physics, which is a very simple equation, you know, how you can actually describe the motion. So, you know, the only thing that you need to know from Newtonian physics here is that the momentum is conserved. And using that, you can see whenever you exchange the balls, how you will start moving apart. That's the only thing that you need to know. However, in, in elementary particles, um, this is the quantum world, and then the rules of the quantum world are different. And of course, they are different and more complicated. Um, and this gigantic uh, uh, set of expressions here is the so-called the Lagrangian of the standard model. The Lagrangian has to satisfy certain properties uh, of nature, such as that the theory doesn't change over time, such as the theory is in, you know, doesn't change if you rotate the system or if you move the system from one to another. So this theory, this Lagrangian, quote unquote, I'm not sure if you know about that, but it is, in, you know, it is true here or in the moon or outside of the galaxy. It is the same Lagrangian. Now, the, each of the pieces that goes into this are basically the fields like the quarks and the gluon fields so uh here you can see that this these cues are basically the quark fields and they are they are getting combined each other uh with the gluon fields in order to describe the interactions so this lagrangian here tells you basically how what you know how they actually interact each other and um how do we go from here to actually doing a calculation that is probably beyond the scope of my talk, but you know you have 
basically two methods of doing that. One is to brute force solve this problem on a gigantic computer, and this is known as lattice QCD. And then the other one is just to try to attempt to, you know, uh, find out configurations uh, of, of the reaction that are calculable by hand and isolating pieces that you can calculate and pieces that you cannot calculate. So that was the stuff that I mentioned at the very end, like the, when I mentioned factorization, where you can calculate things. So this set of equations here gives you a set, set of rules to be able to calculate probability amplitudes, which you can square and you can compute the cross sections. And those rules go under the name of Feynman diagrams, which are very famous, appears even uh, uh, in movies and so on and so forth. If, hopefully I have answered that question. <laughs> Thank you. Could you perhaps tell us slightly about you, how about your path? You told us that you started in general relativity and then then moved to nuclear physics. Could you tell us how that happened? How you got excited by nucleons and nuclei? Right. So, um, so um, when I started, you know, in undergrad, um, learning about GR there were concepts that comes in which was hadronic matter uh, or leptons and i didn't have like a really good in, you know training on that there were no particle physicists and by the way i started physics not because i was good at physics when i was in high school i i was really bad at physics to start with you know i didn't understand anything whatsoever Actually, that was the main motivation why I wanted to study physics, because it was intriguing. I was obsessed for the fact that I didn't understand. Now, one thing that I learned over my physics career is that not necessarily you will learn more by being you know, in, the, in physics. Um, you will learn how much you don't know. And so for me, the experience of being in so many years in physics it's a story about learning how much I have ignored or I didn't, I wasn't told about. And then and the nature is way more complicated than as it simply is put. And all this story that I told you here is probably book part okay, but there are many missing and opening, uh, open questions. So how do I transit from general relativity and cosmology to particle physics? The key connection was the so-called quantum field theory. So quantum field theory was sort of dropped at me when I was in college, and I was really intrigued about how to calculate things in the quantum world. I was told that I can calculate things in the quantum world, and I can sort of predict uh, ex you know, experimental observations like those histograms. And I was fascinated about that possibility. And then I realized that it's way more difficult than I thought, but okay, I try to manage my life to wear it and and I've succeeded to keep doing research. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, you know, you know, there is always a pathway to do, to become a physicist um, in particle physics. And it doesn't mean that you, you know, that if it doesn't work out at the end, it's not the end of the story. Most of my friends, actually almost 99% of, of my friends who started physics are, uh, with a PhD with me, they are not longer in particle physics. I'm kind of the weirdo that stayed in physics and managed to get a job. But all of the people are very happy, you know, having a great jobs, you know, because all the skills that you learn in terms of theory, analytic methods, as well as computing, a lot of this stuff that I I skip over is our, you know, is that it's not just me doing some kind of calculations by hand, but also crafting numerical codes. Uh, that are very essential to be able to connect with experimental data. Thank you, Nabo. That was very inspiring. Do you have, we're coming towards the end of the session. Would you perhaps have some last words for the students? Oh, I was not prepared for that. Um, um, well, I was told that there is a lot of, you know, um, a lot of people from South America, you know, um, maybe viewing this and also foreigners, you know, outside of US. Um, one of the things that, you know, I 
I, I, I was always motivated or my, one of my dreams, basically, when I was in college, it, it was, it would be really cool if I get paid by reading books, reading papers and making papers. That would be a really fascinating thing. And I can guarantee you that you can get paid by doing that. Uh, that seems very, un, you know, un, you know, uh, very difficult to do when you are living outside of the U.S., especially in, you know, in undeveloped countries like, you know, Colombia, where I come from, where, you know, getting paid by doing something that not everyone around me cares, you know, uh, um, was a reality. I realized that that's actually possible. And so particle physics is a place where you can really achieve that which is, you know, getting paid just by learning, you know, and there is nothing better award that you can get just, you know, you know, if you just get, you know, paid by making yourself better or learning more. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. That is very inspiring. And with that, I think we can close the session. Thank you very much.